Welcome everybody to the JPI AMR webinar, AMR Research in a Post-Pandemic World. My name is Patrick Fagerstedt. I'm a research officer at the Joint Program Initiative on Antimicrobial Resistance. And we have today two webinars on different aspects linking AMR research and the COVID-19 pandemic. As you may know, the Joint Program Initiative on Antimicrobial Resistance is a collaborative effort of 28 member countries supporting AMR research and activities like this. We have a strategic research and innovation agenda on antimicrobial resistance covering the six areas of therapeutics, diagnostics, surveillance, transmission, environment, and interventions. And we are also supported by the European Commission as a full non-voting member of the JPIMR. This webinar series is the first of a kind, and uh, we want to use this opportunity to highlight and clarify the importance of AMR research during the current COVID-19 pandemic. In these webinars, we will have world leading researchers and clinicians discussing the prevalence of bacterial co-infections, best practice, appropriate use of antibiotics and opportunities and challenges for AMR research in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also of future viral pandemics. As the moderator for this webinar, we have Jesus Rodriguez Banio, who is the head of infectious diseases division at the University Hospital Virgen Magdalena in Madrid, no, Seville, sorry. He's also the professor of medicine at the University of Seville. Please, Jesus. Thank you very much, Patrick, for the introduction and welcome everyone to this webinar. And thank GPI AMR for organizing it and for inviting me to moderate this very interesting webinar. We have a fantastic panel of experts who will be discussing about some questions that we will going to address them. So we hope a very lively discussion and I'm going to very brief, briefly introduce our speakers today. You can see that we have Norio Omagari from the National Center of Global Health and Medicine Hospital in Japan. We also have Rinivas Morsi from BC Children's Hospital in Canada. We have Evelina Taconelli from uh, a hospital, University Hospital in Verona. We have Gianmaria Rossolini from Florence Carretti University Hospital in Italy. Constance Schultz from the Amsterdam University Medical Center and Uni University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And finally, Alison Holmes from the Imperial College uh, in the United Kingdom. So uh, the way it's going to work is that we are going to make a question to our experts. We are going to address this question to one of them initially, but the question will be open for discussion among all of them and all of us. So uh, some of the questions are more general than others, but we have a good collection of questions and we will need to be discussing very different aspects. So all, all the speakers know that we have to be short in our discussion in order to be on time. So my first question uh, will be addressed uh, initially to, to Alison. Uh, and it's a very general question, but Alison will help us to picture it and build the profile of the discussion that we're going to, to make. So what are the implications of COVID-19 on the global issue of antimicrobial resistance in general, but also for COVID-19 patients? Alison. Great, thank you, Jesus. And I'm really glad that this actually is an opening question. I think it's really important that we think about this much more broadly than I think we currently are. Um, there's been huge amounts of focus, of course, on the um, ventilated patient, and that is absolutely critical. Um, but there's been far less focus on the non-ventilated COVID patient. There's been even far less focus on the, um, the COVID patient in the community and even less focus on the impact on COVID naive population and what the pandemic means there in terms of antibiotic use, antibiotic prescribing, and indeed um, access to appropriate antibiotics. So I think whilst there's got to be a focus on you know, the use in the um, acute care and in um, intensive care, we need to think of the broader picture. So I'm delighted we're opening with this type of question. 
And we also need to recognize that prolonged ventilation, of course, will lead to um, issues around um, um, co-infection and ventilator-associated pneumonia, and of course, the usual type of organisms that are, are seen with that. But we need to un unpick that a, a bit and also um, get a little bit more standardized data. But we need to think about what's happening with this major disruption in how we deliver healthcare um, and um, the decrease in admissions that we've been seeing. And, you know, we know our E. coli bacteremias have gone down, but that's not because everything has got better. That's because we're not seeing these patients. Um, so we need to consider that in the mix, not just what's happening in our intensive care units. We also need to understand what's happening in primary care. Are things going up? Are things going down? Are we seeing excessive infections? Or are we seeing a lot less because of infection prevention practice? And talking about infection prevention practice, I mean, what's that going to mean in the future in terms of the transmission of antimicrobial resistance, both within acute healthcare in terms of healthcare associated infection and within you know, transmission of community um, infectious diseases. You know, what, and also what's the disruption in accessing, um, accessing healthcare for the management of your TB or MDR TB? What's the impact on the disruption in maybe um, vaccine delivery programs? So I think it's really important that we begin to consider the interplay of excess use and also access to effective treatments and how it all interlinks. I don't think it's just about the ventilated patients, although of course that's a really critical area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, it is a problem that affected specifically some patient, but also the whole hospital. I don't know if any of the members could, would like to make a, a rapid comment on this uh, general question that Alison addressed, or maybe we can go for the general uh, for the specific, more specific questions, I would say. Thank you, Alison. You, you will be participating in the other questions as well. So my, my next question will be uh, uh, addressed to, to Norio. So Norio, yes. it's related to bacterial co-infections in, in this uh, COVID-19 patient. So uh, first, which bacterial co-infections have been observed? What is the number or proportion of this infection caused by multi-drug resistant bacteria? also colonization by the mucidrachis and bacteria. And is this connected, what has happened in different hospitals related to this previous epidemiology of multidrug systems? Oh, thank you so much for asking that question. Um, it appears that, um, you know, I'm, um, it appears mm -hmm. that I'm um, talking about the, uh, uh, the you know, pneumonia in the, or healthcare certain infection in the intubated patient, it appears that the pathogen the epidemiology of the pathogen will depend on the uh, what was happening previously, basically. And uh, talking specifically about the ventilator, uh, ventilator associated pneumonia, it appears that um, most of the pathogen is uh, you know, like a pseudomonas and the enterobacteria, including Krebsiella pneumonia. So to me, it appears that um, what's happening in terms of the ventilator uh, associated pneumonia. It's pretty much similar to what is happening previously. I mean, before the COVID-19 era. Thank you very much. I think that uh, an, an important point here is whether most of the co-infections have happened as an osocomial infection, or mm -hmm. if many of the infections have been diagnosed together or at the same time of presentation of the COVID-19 ah, patients. Right, so, right. Any comments on that? Yeah, can I ask one, uh, can I add something? Um, yeah, you are right. Uh, actually, we, in the very beginning, before we have uh, enough experience with COVID-19 pneumonia, we expected that we might have, you know, co-infection with uh, streptococcus pneumonia, or st st even stuff all this as well. However, which we didn't see that, almost at all. That was surprising, because it, that's usually occurs in the case of the, uh, you know, influenza, but which doesn't occur in the case of the COVID-19 pneumonia. Thank you. I think that's a very important point because uh, in many hospital protocols, antibiotics were included as first line uh, for these patients. And mm -hmm. I think that we've learned enough to know that uh, the, only a minority of these patients have a coin bacterial infections when they present mm -hmm. to the hospital. I don't know if one of our clinical microbiologists 
have any information about this co-infection issue? How, how many patients have you diagnosed of having the COVID-19 plus a bacterial co-infection at the same time? I don't know, Jean-Marie, if you would like to make any comment on that? Oh, yes, there are a few reports in the literature about uh, either co-infections or secondary infections by bacteria or fungi. And the rates of these uh, co-infections slash secondary infections is uh, between 10 and 20%, more or less. This is, was also our experience uh, in our setting. We uh, had uh, uh, more or less a rate of uh, secondary infections of 18%. And what we observed was that these co-infections, uh, the nature of the pathogens, uh, uh, reflected the local epidemiology uh, that was present before uh, uh, the COVID emergency. So indeed, we observed co-infections acquired in the hospital after hospital admission uh, by uh, uh, multi-resistance Enterobacterialis, including uh, carbapenemase producing Enterobacterialis and uh, a carbapenem resistant acinetobacter and multi resistant uh, pseudomonas. Thank you, Jean Marie. Uh, Constance, is there your experience as well? Yeah, I and it's very interesting. I would like to, to make two points. So, first of all, of course, it indeed depends very much on the local epidemiology, which um, I am now based in the Netherlands and, and we see far less multi drug resistant pathogens, of course. Um, but it is primary. It seems to be primarily related to ventilation, so ventilator-associated pneumonia. What we see, um, so that is in agreement, I think, with what John Maria says. But I would like to make another point, and that is that the data that we have so far are from settings where there is, to some extent, clinical microbiology available for patients who are admitted to the hospital. Now, these are so we haven't been able to look at similar type of data from Asia or the African setting and basically I'm, I'm not sure we know whether it matters what geographic environment you're in um, to, to make this statement so universal basically global to say that secondary infection in that originated in the community hardly occur and I think that's what we say and this is something that we see with influenza we say people come in with the staff or is on top of the influenza and that's their reason for being admitted because they have this uh, severe bacterial infection apparently we don't see that with COVID but we don't know whether that's true for all settings yet and I think we need to to be very careful and actually this is one of you know what we're discussing I think we need to find out whether that's indeed true for all settings thank you Thank you. Srinivas, any, any uh, comments on children about this? Uh, I, I just want to highlight one extra thing that was just said as well, is that, that that fundamental knowledge gap that's here right now as to the burden of co-infections and the nature of co-infections. We've spent a great deal of time over the past six months trying to figure out our diagnostics for COVID-19 and trying to optimize our management for COVID-19. Um, and in that we've not neglected, but haven't appropriately addressed the burden of antimicrobial issues attached to these patients. We don't know, for example, the burden of use in Canada compared to the UK, compared to Europe, compared to Africa. We don't know the burden of co-infections. And we don't know the colonization versus infection component in many of these cohorts. And so forward, I think trying to position AMR research in that context so that we can learn as much as possible to better appropriately use antibiotics. Back to your question, clinically, I'm a pediatric clinical um, infectious diseases and critical care clinician. Um, we've had a, obviously a relatively sparing number of cases, which is thankfully a good thing. Um, and so from an antimicrobial use perspective, um, it's been a relatively a smooth course without much burden of disease. Thank you. So what, one issue that is raised here is how can we identify those patients coming with a potentially co -inf bacterial infection in order to provide them adequate treatment, but avoid uh, uh, inappropriate use of antibiotics that we will discuss in later. So, Evelyn, I would like to, to, to ask you about this. So do we have any 
data that help us to identify those patients. I know that procalcitonin is being used for that, but what is your opinion? Is, is there any clinical or biomarker laboratory data that it can help us? Yeah, uh, thanks, Jesus, uh, uh, for the question. Um, I would be here maybe a bit critic, but I think we should avoid that COVID-19 uh, disrupts uh, the, everything we did for antimicrobial stewardship. So why I'm saying that? Because I think that we should not change uh, the stewardship program and all the procedure we have been uh, elaborating and developing in the last years for uh, defining patients at risk of bacterial infection. So the COVID-19 patients, they have uh, already comorbidities the majority of time. So we are very much used in having these patients in intensive care unit as well in the medical world. And I think the approach to the antibiotic therapy should be exactly the same at three levels. So individual patient, hospital patients, according to the epidemiology and risk of transmission and society level. So in my opinion, what COVID-19 did is very much showing the Achilles uh, heel of the fight against antimicrobial resistance. Because every time you have uh, clinical uncertainty, then uh, you increase antibiotic usage because there is this uh, lack of awareness uh, of the real burden of prescribing inappropriately antibiotics uh, that we are not able to solve until now. So I think the COVID showed that we had a huge problem of ineffective communication uh, from stakeholders uh, to the medical doctors and within the hospital, because still every time we have patients in severe condition, you will have a high percentage of us just prescribing antibiotics. The same happened with the azithromycin, just with this phony idea that any case is not such a big deal if you prescribe antibiotic if the patient is in a critical condition. And I think there is no evidence at all that prophylaxis is helping really mild cases or severe cases of COVID. I think there is no evidence that azithromycin or tacoplanin, because it was also tacoplanin, rise sometime uh, as a possible uh, uh, immunomodulator effect for the COVID. So I, I would conclude saying that uh, this is exactly the situation where doing nothing is a difficult action, but for antibiotics uh, should be what we aim to. So I would say just keep exactly the same stewardship indication you have been using until now and cost us really a lot in the last years. Just use the operational procedure you have been using until now but what we do not have to forget that when we make a preparedness plan for a, a global pandemic, all these procedures should be clearly integrated. And I think this is also something else where we failed. We forgot that it's essential that all the stewardship programs are clearly integrated in all the diagnostic for this type of patients. Thank you. Uh, last comment, uh, maybe Alison can comment on that. Uh, one question here, one problem here is that people who are in, engaged in, in stewardship program, infection control, may be too busy to do their work in here. So Evelina was talking about preparation. So how to deal with that? So I, I think, in, in, you know, I, I completely agree with what Evelina says. In fact, that this emphasizes the need to have embedded stewardship and um, programs that cannot be disrupted indeed indeed need to be ramped up but that also needs to be um, part of national policy and preparedness I wouldn't mind just picking up on a, a couple of things um, that Evelina said when I mentioned disruption I did not mean disruption of antimicrobial stewardship activity or disruption of clinical microbiology I meant disruption of our healthcare pathways of how people are accessing healthcare, even the non-COVID, our non-COVID patients, what's happening with them, all our hematology patients and immunosuppressed patients we're not seeing anymore. Um, so I meant the complete disruption of healthcare. I think that the AMS programs should absolutely not be considered um, to be disrupted and they should be maintained. I also want to make a point, somebody else can probably say a bit more about this, but the WHO recommendations, are, of course, are are not recognizing co-infection on presentation of mild or moderate disease. Um, I think that's right, please correct. 
me of that, but it's only uh, with severe disease. And then the other, the other thing that, I, um, that is coming through and I think we need to emphasize is that the importance of, of local epidemiology and understanding that actually shapes what you do. And during this time, that should not be compromised. So, you know, are places still maintaining what they do in terms of CPE screening? Are those main, you know, are we keeping a close idea, a close view on what's happening with trends or was that all compromised? Because that's really important that that gets continued to inform individual practice as well as policy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's go for the next uh, question or topic. And I'm addressing initially to Evelina. So that the point is, the question is, uh, what defines appropriate use of antibiotics in COVID-19 patients specifically? Uh, do we have any criteria yet? Do we have to uh, do some uh, um, investigation here? So how to define that when we are evaluating the quality of prescriptions in COVID-19 patients? Yeah, I mean, I follow up uh, on what uh, uh, we have been discussing during the last point and Alison also uh, underlined. Um, I think that uh, what is very much essential um, that we include all the uh, path uh, that we develop for the diagnosis of co-infection within the plan for addressing COVID. Again, sorry to repeat that, but I do not believe that a mycoplasma co-infection would be different in a COVID patient than a not COVID patient coming with BPCO in the ER. Um, I think we should uh, really stay calm, uh, even in a dramatic situation like also my hospital had uh, in the last three months, but we should keep using the same uh, recommendation. Uh, something that maybe could be very useful in the appropriate antibiotic prescribing in this patient that, that also could be a lesson that we learn from the COVID-19 is the multidisciplinary approach. That I think the COVID-19 deserves more than any other recent uh, emergency we have been involved and would be impressively useful for the antimicrobial stewardship. And for the COVID-19, this was possible in one week. So in one week, I can say that uh, having more than 300 patients uh, in the hospital with COVID-19, what was really useful was having together uh, specialists in respiratory infection with ICU, with pharmacologists, infectious disease physicians, clinical microbiologists, working in one team every day. That was exactly what we have been asking for years for the stewardship. Uh, including also infection control, can you believe it, every day together in try to solve the problem. And was not possible until now. But I think if you have this approach of linking together risk of infection, a perfect diagnosis panel like PCR when a patient is arriving in the emergency room, what should include in your setting according to the age of your patients, in this case elderly population in particular, then you should include exactly the test you need for making also a diagnosis of co-infection. Then I think that's exactly the place where multidisciplinary will be working in reducing inappropriate antibiotic usage. Thank you very much. I think that's, that's an important point because as, as we have seen in the, some of the uh, uh, court studies published, uh, in some of them, even higher than 80% of the patients are receiving antibiotics of COVID-19 patients. That means that uh, quite a substantial number of them are receiving antibiotics and probably in, in many of the cases is uh, absolutely unnecessary. As you said, diagnosis here is very important. It's, it's an important aspect. And also clinical judgment that you say we should apply, but we do in, in other infections. But the problem may be in the, when a country starts with a problem and the, during the first weeks where doctors are still not very much experienced in the management of these patients, everybody gets nervous, uh, uh, seeing patients with serious infection, and then we have problems. So I would like to ask Norio about your experience with that. So uh, what is the experience in Japan about the use of antibiotics in these patients and how can you evaluate uh, the quality of prescriptions? Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. In the very beginning, as, as we didn't have enough experience for taking care of patients with COVID-19, you know, we have to say that we have overtreated the patient with antimicrobial because 
first time we see this pneumonia, we didn't know this is uh, just a pneumonia was called COVID-19 or could be, uh, you know, just an expression of co uh, co-infection uh, by a bacteria, uh, you know, as a bacteria, which we didn't know, we didn't know that. So we became to the side, uh, went to the side of the uh, overuse of antimicrobials. Um, and uh, one thing I had, I felt that this is a barrier is the, uh, um, to take care of the patient with COVID-19. You know, we have to wear a PPE and we have to do a strict, uh, you know, infection prevention, prevention control. It sometimes will be a barrier for the uh, correct diagnosis because the time to see the patient, like a physical diagnosis, will be quite short. And we maybe hear some barrier to take a sample from the patient, including blood culture and uh, sputum samples as well. That might have be a barrier for the correct diagnosis uh, for the patient with co-infection as well. So um, that was a barrier I felt. But uh, you know, I totally agree with uh, Evelina, you know, about the uh, you know the importance of the multidisciplinary activity. You know, um, by uh, you know put all the expertise together, we can decrease the risk of uh, you know the misdiagnosis of a co-infection, which I really felt that through this uh, multidisciplinary activity. Um, so, yeah, again, I totally agree with Evelina. Thank you. Um, anybody, uh, Evelina, yes? Yeah, just very, very briefly, one head that I think is important to, to we discuss together, and I'm happy to hear from the colleagues what they think about it. One of the mistakes that we have been doing at the beginning, I think, was also choosing wide, uh, um, wide spectrum antibiotics. Um, and this is uh, maybe one of the problem that we just forget about the stewardship, but many of those patients we are not really in the need of wide spectrum antibiotics. So even if we are in a situation of emergency, this we are not patient coming from high risk of antimicrobial resistant infection. So even if they had a co-infection, there was no need for carbapenem or Piptazo or whatever they have been using just as soon as the patient was coming into the ER. Like all the stewardship and the idea of bacterial infection was completely forgot. And I think also the de-escalation was not being applied in the proper way. Thank you. I think Srinivas wanted to make a comment. I wanted to highlight Dr. Tacanelli's point about collaboration. And I think what I've seen anyway from this pandemic is that all of our specialties in our individual hospitals, our public health officials, everyone is, is working together to solve a problem. Um, and as we look forward to antimicrobial research and antimicrobial use issues, um, these communities that have built up across specialties being clinical ICUs and primary care physicians, infectious disease, microbiology, public health, everyone knows each other very well now. Um, and we can use these opportunities as we build these communities of practice to sort of build an agenda and a framework for antimicrobial research work. Um, because as we all know, knowing people and building a community of research is one of the fundamental parts of solving a problem together. Okay, thank you. Yes, Constance? Yeah, just briefly, I, would, I, I fully unread what you're saying and I just want to add a somewhat positive note because if you do manage to get, to keep the parts together that, that now come together. Um, it actually does work because from experience, we have that in a, you know, in, in the Netherlands, we do have quite a strong collaborative field of, in, of ICU doctors and, and clinicians and clinical microns. And actually we did manage in our, at least in our hospital to, re, to, to uh, reduce the use of antibiotics in those who are not on ICUs. Um, broad spectrum is kept trixel in our hospital and we we moved back to 48 hours max when there was no other reason. So it is, I just want to give a positive note that indeed keep it the momentum because it, the next time it happens, uh, you may be actually able to do, to do it the way you like it. So Thank that's you. what I would like to add. Alison, briefly. So very briefly, one of the things we really do need to harness is to remember that infection prevention is really quite useful. Um, and outside a pandemic situation, infection prevention is a critical aspect of, of antimicrobial resistance and antimicrobial stewardship. And let's hope we can remember that. Thank you. Uh, so let, let's move to the next, next point. So it's, uh, I will be addressing Srinivas for this one. So it's related to uh, 
what is the impact of COVID-19 patients on antimicrobial use in general population, not only in the specific patients with mm -hmm. the COVID-19 infection, but in the general population. And whether do you see or have information about differences in different countries? So I think this once again highlights areas of need of research. Um, I would love to say that one country is doing better than another country and then other countries can follow that model. But in the absence of high quality data um, that's linked to patients at the patient level to assess severity of disease and so on, it's difficult to say um, what the true impact at the COVID-19 pandemic has on antimicrobial use. Anecdotally, we can obviously say that many more patients are seeking out antibiotics in the community and in general practice because they have symptoms um, and it requires a good deal of stewardship and education to ensure that appropriate antibiotic use is in place. Um, obviously, the azithromycin situation where many outpatient providers are providing it with the idea that it might be beneficial for COVID-19 um, is an ongoing challenge and good data is very important there. One thing I do want to, want to highlight in this regard is the, the immunization story um, in that with the pretty much global decrease over the past six months in burden of immunizations that have been received by the population. What we do know um, as one of the most effective um, tools for antimicrobial resistance is having good, strong vaccination programs. And as those vaccination programs become challenged by the health system being strained and people being unwilling to seek out care, one of my concerns going forward over the next few months is an increase in antibiotic use for actual bacterial infections um, because of that decreased immunization rate and burden. Um, but that's something to keep in mind as we sort of move forward and sort of reintegrate our health system. On your comparative country question, and I think um, fundamentally that speaks to the local epidemiology. Our colleagues from Holland who have always had a low rate um, of multi-drug resistance are, are probably experiencing the same thing right now and our colleagues in places where there's more multi-drug resistance are experiencing more multi-drug resistance right now. And so I think a fundamental knowledge of your local epidemiology and practice is obviously crucial to move forward. Thank you. I see that Norio wanted to make a comment. Yeah, actually, um, I think this question is quite tough to me. And, uh, I don't know. Actually, I have no idea what's going on in the community in terms of the primary care. But uh, we can make some assumption. Um, I mean, we can make some hypothesis. First one is what we witness in our country is uh, during the, uh, the peak of the uh, COVID-19 outbreak, we saw that uh, decreasing number of outpatient visits in general. So that might have, might have contributed although I don't know for sure, but I might have contributed to decreased use of antimicrobials in the community. This is one assumption, but uh, however, at the same time, we can also say that um, this may, this COVID-19 may have contributed to overuse of antimicrobials because the primary care physician did not want to make a diagnosis for the uh, influenza-like illness by taking sample. I mean, uh, so they tried to avoid Make a microbiological diagnosis and uh, to say, but just to you know for the uh, goodwill to save the patient, they may have an, uh, prescribed antimicrobials anyway. It may have contributed to the uh, increased use of uh, IMU, but uh, we don't know what what happened. So so I agree with you. Um, we need a research for that. Thank you. Thank you. I think that uh, set up a very interesting point about immunization. So maybe. A point to discuss would be would, would be the impact of influenza immunization in the next season in the north, northern hemisphere, uh, hemisphere. So, uh, is this something that we should be worried about? Is something that we should promote even more heavily than usually? Uh, any is there any uh, intervention plan in your countries? For example, in that area, uh, we, we, there, there is some uh, interventions that have been thought uh, about how to how to increase significantly the, the population at risk that is uh, vaccinated. So any comment about that? Alison, maybe you can 
Yeah, I, I was um, I was wanting to pick up on 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 some of the things that um, Srinivas was saying. So we mentioned about how it was critical that we look at the broader implications beyond ventilated patients, and one of the key aspects will be impact on on immunisation. Um, but one of the and, and we really don't understand what's happening in primary care and and in the community. There are reasons for prescribing to go up, but there are also reasons for prescribing to go down. It's also really interesting that the use of telemedicine may make people feel that they should prescribe because it's easier but at the same time fewer people are seeking access when they actually may really really need it the other thing is the social distancing that countries are introducing may have a significant impact on the transmission of community infectious diseases so we really don't understand yet what's going on in the communities and in the different settings and, and different countries. And I think this is really incredibly critical and will have a direct relation to how we manage influenza and what are, what's going to be the impact on how we deliver vaccinations for um, flu going into the winter. What will be the acceptability? Um, what will, will numbers go down because of, of, of practice in terms of infection control? Will our coverage rates of our healthcare workers be much higher than it's been in the past? Some of this is really, this is completely unknown, but you know, we need to prepare for that and, and, and think about it. And I'm sure there are much better experts than me to talk about that. Well, I would expect that the, the information that is coming out about the non-efficacy of acitromycin will happen help us primary care doctors not to, to be using this drug massively as have occurred in, in some areas. I think that that would probably be very, very helpful. Any other, any other comments on, on this aspect? If not, uh, I think we can move for the, for the next uh, point. Um, it will be uh, for Constance. So Constance, what is the impact and, and implications of COVID-19 on uh, resistant, but also on antimicrobial use surveillance. So we're talking about surveillance. So how we do get the data for, for this in this situation? Well, thank you, Jesus. Um, yeah, it, it depends on where we are probably. And I think some of it has been touched upon already a little bit, but uh, the strain on the healthcare systems. So, um, so the, the hospitals have to cope with high, with huge pressure on, on patient care. And I think Nouriel mentioned already that, that that must have had effect on diagnostic procedures. And, um, and we need to realize that most of the MR surveillance as it's happening now is, is laboratory based passive surveillance, which means that we're actually depending on diagnostics done by clinicians to get data. And, and so actually what you could say is that in the most crucial time where we need to see impact of our, of our potentially in a likely inappropriate usage, we actually primarily don't have the data to follow that, what we are doing. So that is, that is really an, an issue. And um, so, so we, are, we are sort of in a squeeze and we should basically ask ourselves how in this type of setting we monitor trends. And uh, this is a discussion, a bigger discussion, you know, should we base our surveillance on laboratory-based passive surveillance systems, how representative they are, are they, and so on. And that's particularly true in, in low middle income countries where we have often have very limited diagnostics as a default. Um, but now we maybe need to think of, okay, we, we, we have this experience in a pandemic. This is the way we react. How are we gonna do this next time? Can we design different modes of surveillance so that we actually can, you know, even if the strain is too much, if we have limited diagnostic capacity, how do we deal with that to get the actual data that we need? So that, that's something that I would like to pull up. So same, it's very similar for usage. So there's those places where there are electronic patient files, uh, probably we can get an impression of, of what the usage has been, at least what prescription has been. But in settings where there isn't, we, we basically have, are likely to have an information gap because of the, the pressure that's been on the system. So, so taking this together, I think we should look at, at uh, you know, different modes of surveillance that may be needed in, in, in pandemic times. Um, it would be interesting to see if, we, if that's an option. And the other thing, of course, is also just discussed is at primary care level where surveillance 
uh, of AMR and use is, is in general difficult to achieve, um, we have even a bigger problem. And as the azithromycin was mentioned uh, several times already, um, we actually do know from, from uh, international programs with mass administration of azithromycin for completely different reasons, that actually uh, resistance does come up pretty quickly if you do that. And actually we are using azithromycin for many different uh, indications, uh, particularly in the primary care. So we are at risk here. And I, and I could argue that we should actually maybe do targeted surveillance to see in particular patient populations, what is the status of our azithromycin resistance to be, you know, to be smart and, 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 and targeted um, to get the information quickly. So these are the thoughts that I have. And, uh, Propositions to make. Thanks. Thank you very much. I think that uh, one uh, important point that you raise is passive, passive versus active surveillance. And I wanted to ask uh, Jan Maria if, if in, in hospitals where uh, the pandemic has has uh, got a big impact, uh, have you seen a reduce in the number of for example, screening samples for resistant bacteria that you have received in the lab, or have, have you been able to maintain the level of screening? Uh, that was uh, one of the major impacts uh, of COVID-19 on AMR diagnostics. The impact was on screening, and I would like to share with you our personal experience in our region where we had started just the year before a screening, molecular screening for uh, at-risk admissions for multi-resistant, uh, carriage of multi-resistant pathogens, and uh, especially for CPEs, carbapenemase producing enterobacter virus. So all hospitals were required normally to screen at admission for CPEs at risk patients, which meant around 60% of all admissions. Now, what happened with the COVID-19 uh, 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 pandemic was that there was a shortage of platforms, diagnostic platforms for molecular detection of uh, SARS-2 virus, and also a shortage of uh, reagents for the extraction. So we had to reconvert the platforms used for screening of CPEs to uh, a diagnostic platforms for COVID. And we have to go back to cultural screening for CPEs and other resistant pathogens. And this, of course, had some impacts on the level of infection control and prevention practices, uh, which combined and was compounded by uh, relent, uh, 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 to relent uh, the attention on this by the uh, uh, individual wars, especially the ICU wars, because at that, in those wars, I would say there was uh, a workload overflow, which needed the uh, uh, recruitment of an experienced personnel. So there was a, a lot of, there were a lot of physicians that had no experience on that. And there was also maybe an emotional overflow uh, uh, so people considered COVID uh, patients, COVID patients, without the risk of uh, uh, cross transmission of multi-resistant pathogens. So they were just secluded from other patients, but there was no, uh, uh, or at least not enough attention to isolate COVID patients colonized by multi-resistant pathogens from COVID patients uh, not colonized. And this, uh, of course, resulted in some outbreaks. Then when they realized that uh, there was uh, some improvement, but that was a major impact uh, of a COVID on mm -hmm. AMR diagnostic. I would also to underscore, however, a positive impact. Mm -hmm. Positive impact was that uh, to rapidly diagnose uh, uh, infections and to distinguish if uh, uh, it's COVID or non-COVID, but uh, which could be uh, uh, other pathogens or co-infecting pathogens. There was a strong increase in uh, the use of uh, molecular uh, syndromic panels for respiratory tract infections. And this was quite useful in order to improve the uh, diagnostic capability of the laboratories in this sector, including the early detection of multi-resistant pathogens 
in uh, respiratory tract specimens. Thank you very much. I think that uh, one additional, let's say, methodological issue here in surveillance is the fact that the case mix has changed completely during these two, three months of outbreak in, in, in the hospital that have already gone, gone through them. And we'll, we'll do okay the same in the areas where the epidemic is starting or is increasing right now. So I think that that would impact very much the way we compare the data of antibiotic consumption of resistance during this time, if we want to compare them, for example, with the same period of last year or next year, in next year. So maybe we have to do some uh, adjustment here. So I don't know, Alison, if you would like to comment on that. Uh, for example, in my hospital, surgery was mostly stopped except for emerging uh, operation or oncological operation. So what is, what's the impact of that in surveillance? So that's what we were kind of alluding to when we first opened this discussion, that it's really critical that we, we think about not just the COVID population, but all our other patients who need care and need services. What is going to happen when we open our doors for and how we um, for our immunosuppressed patients and our pathways to keep them safe for surgical patients? So there's one piece around looking at our data now and modeling in the fact that we didn't have this population at that time. And the, the other piece is about how can we keep how can we keep them safe and what, what are the implications for them? So I alluded to the, the um, point before about, you know, our bacteremia rates going way down and we can think, oh, that's marvelous. But actually it's a combination of, we didn't have that patient population who generated those bact bacteremias and maybe the blood culture taking went down. I think Norio was saying about how, um, particularly in, in um, tertiary care, in, um, in, in level three care, people weren't doing as many investigations. So all of that has to come into the mix and it can't just be you know, about the ventilated patient. And I thought that was really interesting, um, really interesting from Jamari about um, how the CPE transmission between COVID patients be became, a bit, uh, became an issue. I, I, would, I would like to take the discussion about diagnostics a little bit further. We, we discussed a bit earlier about the importance of linking diagnostics into decision support. We've got a huge opportunity here for learning, combining not just multidisciplinary expertise and multi-professional expertise, but also bringing different technologies together from diagnostics to point of care diagnostics that can also provide epidemiology and geographical tagging that can then bring in and help us with our epi and our mapping. We've got the great opportunity of looking at decision support systems that can be sensitive and flexible to the patient population shifting, and that can be sensitive to diagnostics that are not just bacterial and viral diagnostics, but are also host factors as well. And I think there are major opportunities to, to learn from that as well going forwards. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it's, this is not specifically related to surveillance, but it's a burning question I think we have to address somehow. So I, Maybe Evelina can comment on that. Is, has the, the PPI inappropriate use contribute to transmission? I mean, universal globin going with the PPI from here to there. How does it impact transmission, what's your opinion? Why do I get the worst question of the day? Uh, the most political sensitive. Uh, uh, I think that there is a huge difference uh, in addressing this question with the knowledge we have now and addressing the question at the beginning of the epidemic. It seems to me that the majority of people are just forgetting that uh, we did not have at the beginning the same knowledge we have now. Uh, my personal opinion here is that definitely there was uh, an inappropriate usage uh, of protective equipment at the beginning of the epidemic. Uh, this in particular uh, in healthcare system where the knowledge of infection control was per se already low. So in this hospital, uh, the introduction uh, of a COVID case had uh, an impressive uh, impact versus a hospital where airborne isolation for interstitial pneumonia was already in place. 
So I think this is something that we do not have to forget. It's not only COVID. It's the knowledge of infection control and again, an antibiotic stewardship in that hospital before COVID. And you cannot trust, I mean, not all the hospitals were the same. And the result of the COVID epidemic is also reflecting that. If I can add only one last sentence uh, on your question, I think also that it would be impossible to compare pre-COVID with uh, after COVID because uh, as John Marie and Alison were saying, we just changed not only the case mix of those hospitals, but also the knowledge uh, and the expertise of doctors because I had gynecologists in ICU helping as well I had uh, uh, dermatologists working uh, in pneumological work. So it's really a completely different situation. What would be very interesting to check is the impact of an impressive uh, substantial increase uh, in hand washing uh, in that population in respect to an increase of antibiotic usage. And I'm sure that applying the right methodologies for data analysis, we can find some interesting answer in what we have been looking for many years, try to understand where it's really best to invest. I'm not saying that you need to choose between stewardship and infection control. Obviously, in the best world, you should have 100% for both. But still, it's important we give numbers and figures to the public health officer and infectious disease physician to answer the question from the words. And this situation, if we analyze the data properly and maybe all together, will give us very important answers. Thank you very much. We need to move for the last, last point and the last question, which is for Jean Maria. So, Jean Maria is related to the impact of diagnostics. So, uh, what can we learn and benefit from the huge efforts that we and you, particularly microbiologists, have done in the COVID 19 situation? I mean, for me, having uh, the result of so many patients in, 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 in three, four, five hours has been amazing. So can we learn something from this to be applied, not only for this situation, but also for other situations in, in antimicrobial resistance, et cetera? Uh, indeed, uh, Jesus, this has been uh, an uh, outstanding experience uh, from which we have learned uh, a lot. Uh, 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 so far in my experience of clinical microbiologists, I uh, uh, was aware that we had to keep uh, workflow, diagnostic workflow, as much as streamlined as possible. So using a single platform to do uh, most diagnostic uh, uh, activities, uh, while in this case, what I have learned is the importance of redundancy. So uh, before COVID, we had to avoid redundancy. And after COVID and in six weeks, I had to set up six different diagnostic systems for COVID in order to cope with the number of tests and the different time frame tests were required. And also to cope with the shortage of reagents. So thanks to redundancy, I could avoid to keep uh, uh, specimens in the fridge until waiting for uh, uh, diagnostics to arrive. So this was important, like in avionics, even in the diagnostic laboratory, we need redundancy. And we need that for the future. We should consider that. And this is an important uh, message that I, I took home, at least for myself. Uh, and the other, the other uh, issue was that, uh, that we had to uh, definitely work on a 24-7 schedule. So uh, not many uh, micro labo microbiology laboratories do that for now. We speak about that, but uh, we only do that for a few activities. Uh, we had to do that for COVID, and so we needed full shifts for that. And at the same time, we could do that for sepsis, which is very important. So an overall improvement in the activity of the laboratory, thanks to the COVID uh, emergency. And this is important. And also, uh, we had, well, that was, of course, uh, uh, a, an opportunity to underscore the importance of the diagnostic system in the, in the uh, hospital organization and the uh, overall healthcare system. 
and uh, we also experienced the shortage of people. Uh, uh, we acquired the people from uh, uh, genetics and from clinical chemistry to help us with COVID, as you in the wars uh, acquired gynecologists or surgeons uh, to help with the patient. And this was also a very important experience, but this also was a challenge in the uh, activity and the accuracy of the laboratory work. Thank you very much. Uh, as you said, yeah, the, the, the importance of the macabologies in this epidemic has been absolutely fantastic. And, and as you said, probably some of our managers and policymakers have learned how important it is to have a 24-7 microbiology lab in everywhere. And, and, and so this is something that probably we should take the opportunity to really tell and, and speak out uh, about that. So I don't know if Alison, would you like to make a comment on that? How can we do that for the future? No, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, my goodness me, uh, you know, the, the role of diagnostics and the colleagues in the laboratory has been just absolutely critical. I think that's, I think that's a really, I think there's two points, one about redundancy and how critical that is. I mean, that's critical for the resilience of all of healthcare and that we don't do enough to build in redundancy into our system so that we can be responsive. I thought that was really interesting. And the issue about, you know, just like we we're saying about telemedicine or whatever, you know, of course we can do 24 seven and we now need to think about that as well. And I think that's, those are two really, really important points and, and let's all get behind, you know, raising the profile of how critical it is that we have a excellent, truly excellent microbiology service supporting and underpinning everything we do. Thank you. Uh, Jan Maria, an additional point here would be preparedness for the next one. So one issue that happened and, and probably the experience in Spain and Italy was very similar in that sense is that when we started to see that we have a problem, the problem was already there for several weeks before we noticed it. That means that we need some alertness and, and microbiology labs able to detect these problems earlier on. How can we do that? Uh, that's another important issue that we have learned from this emergency. And in fact, one of the point was not only to diagnose symptomatic patients, but was also to screen for asymptomatic infections. So we have learned about the use of serology and rapid mass screening serology, at least to uh, at detect at least some cases and uh, uh, antigen search as well. And also the uh, detection of uh, viral traces in uh, uh, just the sewage system, which could be very important in order to map the uh, presence of the virus there. So uh, just uh, think uh, uh, of Jon Snow, how he did to recognize the source of cholera in London in the uh, mid uh, 19th century. So we might also reason in terms of environmental indicators in order to monitor the emergence of pathogens and spillage phenomena. Okay, uh, that last point was not absolutely related to resistance, but I think it was very so, so important for the next one to be, to be absolutely prepared and try to, to avoid what has happened this time. So I think we are on time. I think, I, I never thought we could, having six fantastic speakers talking about this, very interesting issues to be on time, but we did so. So I would like to thank you all very much for, for your comments, for your questions, for preparing this webinar. And I hand it over to Patrick to close the webinar. Patrick. Thank you, Jesus. And on behalf of the JPI AMR, I would like to thank you and the panelists for a very, very interesting discussion and very, very, interesting facts. I learned a lot of this seminar and as you know we have a second webinar coming up in half an hour and some of you in the audience have already uh, joined in. I'd just like to inform you that we will close this webinar so you will have to re-log in again for the, the second webinar that starts at 2.30 so we will open up the registration or waiting room again. Sorry for that. And uh, on a final note, it's difficult to conclude this type of uh, sort of broad discussion, but I think I've sort of, sorry, 
learned that both the disruption of, of the AMR research and AMR prevention and infection control has been a sort of a big effect of the COVID-19, but also there are positive notes of new starts and new collaborations between specialists in the healthcare system that can be very fruitful for the future. So thank you again, and uh, hope to see you again at some time in real life. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.